RuneScape's mid-game is where making money starts to become a real priority. While I do believe that you should still have your main focus be on stats and gaining experience, stacking cash is an easy number too. So what's the point of even making money in RuneScape? Money is used so that you can buy gear that allows you to do more content, which makes it so you can make more money, which makes it so you can buy more gear. It's a never-ending cycle until you don't know what's left to log in for, so you make a YouTube channel. Before we move on to the individual methods, keeping your money is just as important as making more of it, don't lose your money doing stupid shit like giving your money away to these scammers you see on my screen at the Grand Exchange. Other examples include deathmatching like you see here, gambling of any sort, and the gear shuffle. Anyways, that's my little bit of soapboxing. Let's get into the real meat of the video. Currently, these are the best methods that I consider completable with a mid-game account and mid-game gear. There's gonna be hundreds of you that disagree, so please flame me down in the comments below. Wee woo, wee woo, this is not a drill. It's official, Jagex actually made the wilderness worth going into. That's a lot of words on there and I'm not gonna read it all to you. What it says is more money and more experience. Each chest you open gives you 701 experience, netting you around 200K per hour, depending on how quick you are. This comes out to around 2.5 million GP per hour. There's only one hard requirement, which is 84 thieving, but I do strongly recommend that you get the wilderness hard diary completed as it does give you 25% more loot. What we're looking to do with our gear setup is maximize our prayer bonus since we are going to be praying the entire time while also making it very low cost since we are in 53 wilderness and multi-combat you can copy the one that i have on screen here or make your own it really doesn't matter all too much what you wear for this uh, just realize that it is possible that you might die to some PKers. For inventory, I have uh, a little tank set up here. The bulwark is insanely strong for what it does for you. So if you get any PKers, you can just slap that on, become borderline invincible, especially with the people who would PK here. Uh, you are going to want a lot of, I would recommend actually blighted super resources. I just didn't have any in the bank, but they're going to be about half the cost. So you will save a lot of money on that end, which makes you more money at the end of the day. Uh, and then just some brews and some hard food for tanking. Wow, I almost forgot. You do need a looting bag for this. This is not going to be viable without one. Most wilderness enemies drop this as a one in three, so you can pretty much kill anything in the wilderness and you'll get this looting bag really quick. Here's the two chests that we are going to be thieving, but before we do that, let's get our settings in order to make this a little bit more comfy. We need to open our looting bag, so that way all of the loot we get from the chest goes directly into the looting bag and does not go into our inventory. And because the game is stupid, you do need one open inventory spot. Within Runelite, you're going to want to get the menu entry swapper, and we are going to get customizable left and shift click under object swaps, and you, you might as well do the same with item as well. Once you have that set up, what we're going to want to do is come over to the chest, hold down your shift key, right click the chest, swap left click and change it to search for traps that way your left click automatically starts opening the traps when you click them all right boys we're ready to do this and pay attention this is extremely complicated protect from melee click on the chest get your loot once you get your loot you're able to go over here to this other chest there is a little bit of a delay in between there is another chest over here but i've tested this out it is not worth going over this chest i would just stick with this too by the time you get over there thieve it and come all the way back it would have been more efficient just to stay here and i know what you're thinking you're terrified of pkers but honestly i don't really expect you to see too many if any i've sat out here the entire time i've been filming and editing this section of the video and i have not gotten attacked by a single person the entire time um i'm not like in a total level world or anything i'm in 477 anybody can come in here i think you're pretty reasonably safe and honestly if anybody does come this is a pretty high attention activity so you are going to be able to see them coming just you know throw on your tank gear run over here and just go up the stairs and then this is like a four layer staircase so you can just juke them out by going up and down different stairs and eventually they'll pick the wrong one and you can likely get away. So is this actually a good method for you to do? For 84 thieving making two and a half million GP per hour that's pretty nuts and it's good experience so if you do need to train the thieving skill I would recommend giving this a shot. It is a good money maker just because it does give you that much experience. If you already have 99 thieving, I would miss this one entirely. Honestly, I am so nostalgic for these. For the requirements, I recommend 80 plus combats. You are going to want to have desert treasure completed so you can use ice and blood spells. 
And Frem and Elite is not required, but if you do have Frem Elite, you are going to make roughly 800k more per hour. The Dagonoth Kings are a massive tank test, so we want to prioritize our prayer bonus and have setups for each style. You can copy my setup or adjust according to what you have in your bank. I do recommend being on task for this. It's going to make it so much easier to keep the cycle going because you do a lot more damage. As far as my inventory goes, I just have simple two-way switches. If you are more comfortable with this, you can bring more. Things that you absolutely need are poison protection. I recommend sand fuse serums. Yes, they're expensive. Yes, they're totally worth it. The stamina potion is for the extremely lengthy run there, which is why I do recommend the stamina, just because it is such a pain to get there. You want to spend as much time there as humanly possible before having to teleport out. Sora Godsword, great special attack weapon, especially for lasting longer as it gives you more prayer and hit points, and rune throne axes are necessary for getting in. The quantities of things is really going to depend on you, your account, your gear, everything. So adjust accordingly. I recommend just starting with this and seeing how that works out for you. If you're going to do a lot of these, I recommend building a water birth island teleport in your POH. It's going to give you super close access and it's going to help you with this little procedure I'm about to show you. To start off getting there, we need to get a pet rock. So what I like to do is use my water birth island teleport. We're going to drop a potion here and then we are going to take the boat back to Roleka. Once we're here, run over to Ask Aladdin, claim yourself a pet rock really quick just teleport back to your poh then you're going to run back to your water birth teleport and then you can pick up your potion where the teleport used to be the worst part of these bosses is getting there i will quickly run through how to run through the caves to get to them so once we go in we're going to want to go to either the right or the left gate we're going to drop our pet rock go onto the other platform and click on the gate At the next gate, we're going to use the Rune Throne X special attack on one of the other two gates in order to bounce it back to our gate and open the door. There's a few parts of this that are not linear right at the beginning, so just follow along. And at this point, the rest of the cave is linear, so just keep on following it till the end. Once here, you can step into this alcove. You won't be able to be attacked. You can check this crack to see if anybody is currently using this world. Starting off the Dagonoth Kings is the hardest part because you are going to want to kill these in a cycle, but at the start, you have all three fighting you at once. I recommend killing Supreme, then Prime, and then Rex. The start can be pretty hectic, but if you get all of them on you, you can always go back up the ladder and reset where they are down below. If you're doing the DKs, you are in hope of getting the rings. Two of these are not like the others. The Berserker Ring and Archer Ring are still around 4 mil each with the other rings trailing Warrior Rings in a sad state as it always has been. And despite being only 11.5k each, the fact that you get one bone every time means that the bones are actually going to be the biggest part of your profit. This comes out to about 2.5 mil per hour with three pets to get. It's a pretty solid Slayer task. Two thumbs up for me. Today's video is sponsored by me. I don't have any real sponsors, so I'd really appreciate it if you liked and subscribed. So maybe sometime in the future, I can tell you about this sweet new mobile game I'm playing, my favorite VPN, or a meal delivery service. Zenites are back up, which means gorillas are back on the menu. All of your money from this method hinges on getting a Zenite shard. These are 11.5 mil and they drop at a rate of one in 300. You should expect to get one roughly once every five hours. For requirements, there's only one hard requirement and that is completing Monkey Madness 2. I suggest 80 plus combats in order to kill them. And then as far as gear goes, Arclight and Blowpipe are more than enough. For the inventory, we want super combats and ranging potions. We're gonna need something to restore our prayer like super resource or prayer potions bring a bunch of hard food to eat and then you're going to want a royal seed pod in order to teleport out and to get there in the first place in the pouch we're looking at elk runes and then as far as a special attack weapon i brought a sardom and god sword but you're fine if you want to bring claws void waker or anything along those lines the demonic gorillas attack with all three combat styles so you will have to change your prayer throughout the fight the monkeys will change their attack style once you have prayed correctly against their attacks three times in a row this is visually indicated when they say "ra" above their head finally you will have to change your attack style every 50 damage you do currently these are sitting at around three mil per hour which is pretty good compared to other things that you can do at this level with this gear setup. However, I personally don't really enjoy these just because of how clicky they are. Uh, it's just really labor intensive for the amount of money that you can make. But if you are a lower level and don't have that much gear, these are a really good option for you.
Oh wow, Vorkat, what a surprise. Maybe if he sucked more, I wouldn't have to put him on here, but he is quintessentially like the mid-game moneymaker. Vorkath currently sits at around 3.4 million GP per hour, and unlike every other boss on this list, the money is derived from consistency instead of big drops. There are a couple big drops on Vorkath's drop table, but they are so rare and they're not worth that much, so they don't really contribute too much to the overall GP you make here. To fight Vorkath, you need to complete Dragon Slayer 2. I suggest 80 plus for your combat skills, and if you're doing the melee method, I recommend the Dragon Hunter Lance. You probably already do Vorkath, so I don't need to spend too much time on this. Make sure that you do bring a Salve E or a Salve EI. Feel free to copy this setup or make it however you want to. In the inventory, I do recommend a Bando's Godsword. It's a great special attack weapon here. Void Waker, Claws also work just fine. And then for our potions, we have a Super Combat. We have an Anti-Venom Plus, and then we also have our extended Super Anti-Fire. Your Restore or Prayer Pot to food ratio is gonna depend on how fast you kill them. So adjust that accordingly once you start to get the boss down a little bit. And then in our pouch, we do want Crumble Undead. The Vorkath fight is very simple. To start off, we're going to pot up, Pray piety and protect from magic and start whacking away at him. Vorkath will attack with all styles, but they shouldn't do too much damage, heal as needed. When he spits out a big fireball, make sure that you move two tiles away. After six regular attacks, he will do one of two special attacks. The first one is random, and then after that, the two will alternate. For the first one, you will be frozen, and he will spit out a facehugger from the hit movie franchise, Alien. You want to have a magic bonus of higher than 64 so you don't splash on this. I recommend bringing a Slayer Staff or a Staff of the Dead or something like that that can auto-cast Crumble Undead. Use your Crumble Undead spell against this monster, and it is guaranteed to one-hit him. The second attack is his Acid Attack, and you aren't a coward, so you are going to whoop swap this. Once he spits out the acid, you need to keep moving. There are tons of ways to do this, but the easiest one is to just click back and forth on a clear tile, as you can see demonstrated in the video. It might seem daunting at first, but I guarantee that you'll be able to get it down in just a couple of tries. Overall, Vorkath is a great consistent moneymaker, but it can be a little boring because there's not a lot of big exciting drops. I need to rename this video to something about nostalgic bosses from my childhood. It's honestly kind of wild. Bandos is about 5 mil per hour right now. I recommend doing Bandos as a solo due to the long respawn timer. If you can afford it, Crystal and Bofa is going to be your best in slot here, but if you're a little short on cash, a crossbow works just fine. I recommend having at least 85 range, and you do require 70 strength and a hammer to get into the area. I'm going to briefly go over each method, starting with the Bofa setup. However, let's first talk about why we're here. Unlike other bosses, Bando's drops indicate that we are taking the clothes right off his back. All of the loot is basically at an all-time high and easier to get than ever. If you can afford a Ring of Endurance, I do recommend this as you're going to be running a lot, and the Devout Boots are going to be better than the Pegasians, just because the pegs really don't offer all that much. Here's the inventory. We got Ancients, both Ice and Blood in the Pouch with a Magic Switch, Range Pots, Stamina Potions, Bruise Restores, Bones to Peaches Pouches, I'm using the Hilt to get there, and then the Zamorak Cape is for our Zami protection, and I can just drop that later. Due to the weird way that this game works, you can make it so Bandos won't hit you if you hit him and Red X the Altar and Door at the right times. This can be done in a tick-perfect cycle, leading to extremely fast kills. Once you complete the kill, you can blowpipe the mage minion to death and then use your blood spells to heal off the other two. Obviously, there's a lot more that goes into this and I recommend watching a full guide. This one from Quick OSRS is really good and he does a great job of breaking everything down and making it really easy to understand. While this next method you can do with a rune crossbow if you're an Iron Man, if you are a main, I recommend getting at least a dragon crossbow. This is referred to as the 6 to 0 method, meaning that you hit Bandos 6 times in a cycle and Bandos hits you 0 times in a cycle. To make this easier, I recommend turning on True Tile, which will be under Tile Indicators in Runelight. If you go into Tile Indicators, make sure that you do have Highlight True Tile on. What this does is show you where your character currently is in game, because the animation is usually a little bit behind. Here's our basic setup. I got the Zami Dehide and the Bandos Dehide for my God Protection. And then as far as our inventory goes, it's pretty much the same as the Bofa method. This method just uses different tiles and will be a lot slower. You're going to want to mark the tiles that you see here on screen. We're gonna hit Bandos, go to the corner, then skip this tile on the first rotation. After you get to the far corner, you can protect from range and then just hit Bandos when your true tile connects with the marked tile. 
bandage should never hit you this way. If you do mess up, just keep on going. It's going to sort itself out eventually. And because you are going into a circle, it actually groups the minions. So after the kill, you're able to blood barrage all three in a clump. If you don't want to do any of the range methods as they are a little bit more click intensive, you can always get a buddy or two and head on up here and kill bandos like we did back in the day. Get your comments ready because I know what you're thinking. This isn't mid game content, but luckily due to the invocation system, it is. This won't be a full guide because that would be a whole 25 minutes on its own. So we're going to focus on tips and tricks because of our mid game focus. I'm going to stick to a 300 invocation raid level, but you could easily do 400s in this gear setup. I chose 300 because it's easily doable with a crossbow if you can't afford the Bofa. The wiki currently puts these at 7.6 mil per hour. If you are completing two per hour, 30 minute raid seems a little bit fast to me in this setup, it might be possible, but even if you are getting 40 minute raids, this is over 5 mil per hour. Unlike Vorkath, Muspa, and Zora, you're not making shit here unless you get a purple chest. These are the items you're after. If you can't tell, your GP per hour is massively dependent on getting the staff due to the massive value. Completing the Beneath Curse Sands quest is the only hard requirement. I recommend 82 plus combat stats, and that's 82 because for these to be reasonably farmable, you absolutely need the Fang. We're going to be going in on the Arceus spellbook with Thralls and Death Charge. If you are just learning, Ancients is fine. Honestly, just bring Thralls. For your gear setup, you're going to need a Mage, Range, and Melee switch. Feel free to copy this or make it your own. Make sure that you do have a 4-tick attack weapon like the Abyssal Tentacle and a DDS. Invocations are going to be hugely personal preference. What we're looking to do with our invocations is not make the raids slower, but also make it consistently completable. What makes something good invocation would be something like feeling special. Feeling special actively makes the raid faster than it would be if you didn't have this one on. And then something that would be a bad invocation would be something like more overlords, which is like a four minute extra added onto your raid. Before we go in, download the Tombs of a Masket plugin in Runelite, as this is going to solve all of the puzzles for you. We're going to start off with Baba, so let's go to the monkey room. We're going to be focusing on the shamans as our number one priority. You should be doing small switches. You don't need to be doing an eight way switch in the monkey room. And then watch out for the venom monkeys. You can get wrapped around the pillar and take a ton of venom damage. To do these consistently, you really just got to learn red x it's not that bad once you get it down make sure that you don't both of the boulders use your blowpipe on these and then you can also use your bp spec to heal off of them you should be doing kefri next luckily the toa plugin solves all of these puzzles for you for kefri you really got to make sure that you pay attention to where you're stacking the dung so you don't trap yourself and you don't cut off most of the arena Stacking them on corners means that you can continuously use that same corner to stack subsequent dungs. One thing that newer players tend not to focus on is killing swarms when Kefri is recovering. This should be your number one focus as it saves a ton of time on this room. Next we got Akka. You should definitely be learning how to butterfly. It's not all that hard. It's kind of the same thing as the 6-0 method that we talked about for bandos in the last section of this video. Make sure that you do keep an eye on the shadows in your quadrant so you don't get hit by the shadow wave attack. And when it is the orb phase, you need to avoid the orbs first before DPSing. You can't do any damage if you're dead. For Zebek, you want to know where the jugs are going to spawn. The first one's going to be at the front left of the area, and the second one's going to be kind of in the middle on the right hand side. After you do a few of these, you're going to get a feel for it. Make sure that you do know your max hit distance so you don't get dragged into poison, waves, or Zabak's roar attack. And watch out for the tomatoes that spawn. They can uh, really throw a wrench into things. Final boss, the Wardens, is divided into three phases. For P1, you're going to want to fang the obelisk. Bofa works well as two, but fang is better. Just avoid the damage and heal as needed. P2 is the scariest part of the raid in my opinion. You are going to want to make sure that you do anticipate your last hit, which will down the Warden, so that you can be perfect on the core. Missing any ticks on the core can lead to this being a 3-down instead of a 2-down. And the Skull Special is really scary, so make sure that you watch out for this one and just be really careful during it. P3 Wardens is a little bit less scary, but for this one, you're going to want to focus on moving. If you get out of cycle and get hit, just look to see where you need to be next instead of focusing on eating because you're just going to continue to take more damage if you don't get in the right spot. I recommend using the Fang if you're comfortable for it. Range is a little bit easier, but the Fang is going to be your best DPS here. I like to utilize the stay alive method for this. 
As I said in some of these other sections, you can't do any damage if you're dead, so it is worth missing a tick if you're not going to take damage because of it. I understand that by far this is going to be the most difficult moneymaker on this list, but it's also going to be the most rewarding and in my opinion is the most fun. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you did enjoy this video, I'm sure you'll also like my video about escaping the mid game somewhere up above my head here.